What's up, YouTube? This is 82 and 0. Welcome back. Today, we're going to talk about Dolph Shays, one of the most forgotten Hall of Famers of his time. And I'm really happy to see him on the top 75 players list. So, he was born May 19th, 1928, and he was born in the Bronx, New York. Now, Shays, although he grew up in the Bronx, his parents were Romanian Jewish immigrants. And he grew up on Davidson Avenue on 183rd Street near Jerome Avenue. Now, initially when he was in high school, Shays attended Creston Junior High School. And then he would go on to DeWitt Clinton High School in the Bronx. And this is where he'd start getting into basketball. He didn't play any basketball in middle school or elementary. But you got to keep in mind that basketball was an expanding sport at that time you know in terms of popularity it's not like what it is today where you have basketball camps for youth you know everything that you would learn in this time period was either what you would do in your backyard practicing or maybe your high school coach would teach you you know there wasn't a lot of film to study either but anyways he would lead his uh, team to the Borough Championship, and he actually played college basketball at New York University, and um, he would play there from 1944 to 1948, but in 1945, as a 16-year-old freshman, Shays helped the NYU reach the NCAA Finals. Shays earned an uh, engineering degree and was named All-American, and the funny thing about his college stats I can't find a lot of details about the rebounding or assists. That's just the... They didn't keep track of all that collegiate stats. But he averaged 10 points for his college career. Now, the funny thing is, is during this time, there were two basketball leagues. And this is prior to the ABA. I don't mean the ABA. I mean, there was the new BAA, Basketball Association of America, which we know would become the NBA, after they merged with what was the NBL. Now, from what I know, the NBL had a lot of bigger stars at first. You know, they had Shays, Mike, and... But BAA had a lot of money, and they had bigger arenas. So it was bound to merge. But Shays was actually drafted by both the New York Knicks and the BAA draft. He was drafted the first round, the fourth pick. And he was drafted by the Tri-City Blackhawks in the NBL. Now, the Blackhawks traded his right to the Syracuse National, who then offered him a contract worth 7500 which today is the equivalent of 84000 50% more than what the Knicks offered but Shays would play one season in the NBL and was named to the Rookie of the Year. But in the NBL, when he played for the Syracuse Nationals, he averaged 12.8 points per game, and they didn't keep track of rebounds in that time for the NBL, unfortunately. But his team would have a record of 40-23. and 23. Now, as we all know, the BAA and the NBL would merge. So the Syracuse Nationals would actually go over to the NBA, or the BAA, pretty quick. Um, I think they went the year prior to the merger. Because I think the merger was the 50-51 season. But the Nationals went in the 49-50 season. Now, although he was, you know, some people would, today would probably call him a small forward you know he stood at six foot seven and in that era he was i think he's what made the power forward position uh, because you know a lot of times people say bob pettit was the one who invented the power forward position but i really think it was shays because Shays was big enough and strong enough that he could get down low and rebound. 
and he could fight the centers down low in terms of getting the rebounds. But he was also very quick and agile for a guy his size. But one of the best things about his game was his outside shot. Now, I didn't grow up in that era, obviously, but, you know, I played a lot of 2K, and how I got exposed to Dolph Shea's three-point ability, or, well, they didn't have the three-point line back then, but you know what I mean, the range, is I saw his rating for three-point shot, and I was like, what? You know? Now, so I, you know, I started researching him, and this was, of course, a few years ago, but the guy had range. He took a lot of outside shots, which today would be considered three-point shots. He liked to settle for the tough shots, you know, and he would shoot with his offhand, making him especially difficult to guard, and he was, at the time, one of the best two-handed set shots with his feet planted on the floor, which... This was before jump shots became pretty popular. Um, I don't think it was till like the mid fifties when jump shooting became a thing, but you know he mastered the two handed set shot, and later on he'd get a pretty good jump shot. So let's talk about his uh his actual stats in the NBA years now. Let's keep in mind one thing. During the early days of the NBA, George Mikan was the dynasty. Um, George Mikan and the Minneapolis Lakers. Not a lot of teams could break that mold. So the Lakers, they won seven championships between the NBL and the NBA and slash BA. Well, I shouldn't say the Minneapolis Lakers. George Mikan won seven championships. Uh, but in total, the Lakers won six. Five official because they don't count the NBL one. But anyways, that was the Boston Celtics, so to speak, of that time. So he didn't have a... Shays didn't really have a good good enough team around him to win a championship in those early years. But I do want to mention, Shays actually led the league in rebounding in 1951 at 16.4. And one thing that stands out with him too is his free throw shooting. He led the league in free throw shooting three times. And from my research, he played, and I know I might get a lot of hate for this, but he played pretty similar um, I don't mean, like, a clone or anything like that. I mean, you can compare him to Harden. What I mean by that is, he was great at drawing the fouls. He knew how to manipulate the refs to get a foul call. And some of his field goal shooting is a little misleading. Like, much of his prime, he averaged, like, 38% field goal shooting. You gotta keep in mind, he was taking a lot of long distance shots, set shots, you know? How you can tell that the dude was a good shooter is his free throw shooting. He's a career 84% free throw shooter. And he's also a career Iron Man. Um, he consistently, consistently played every game in the season. I think four times. I want to say four or five. Five times he never missed a game in a season. Other than that, he was pretty healthy except for the last couple of se- uh, the last couple of seasons in his career, which we'll get into. But, you know, he was dependable. He consistently played over 40 minutes a night, but I guess that was normal. Back then, a lot of starters played a lot of minutes. Um... Now, early in his early in his career, the Syracuse Nationals didn't have a lot of success. Like I told you, it was the Minneapolis Lakers dynasty. But that didn't mean that this team wasn't there. Um, for example, in 1954, he took his team to the finals against the Minneapolis Lakers. 
Now, this would come down to seven games, and it was still pretty close. The Lakers won 87 to 80 in game seven, but by 55, you know, the Minneapolis Lakers were done. And this is when Dolph Shays took full advantage of that. You know, think about the Minneapolis Lakers as a last dance, so to speak, you know, in 54. They were on their last legs. Mikan was having injuries. They narrowly pulled out that Game 7 victory. But in 55, they defeated the Fort Wayne Pistons in Game 7. Now, this is, to me, um, one of those games I wish I could see because Syracuse Nationals defeated the Fort Wayne Pistons 92-91. to Now, it's been speculated that this game was fixed. What I mean by that is people, I don't know who it would be, uh, you know, they paid players on the Fort Wayne Pistons to blow the game. And the reason they say this is because the Fort Wayne Pistons had such a lead early in the game. And then they just started making a lot of dumb, dumb plays, right? The Syracuse got up. I don't personally believe there's enough evidence, but then again, there's no footage. There's not enough footage to go on, you know? Uh, but nonetheless, Dolph Shays pulled it through. He, he won in Game 7, won his first championship, his only championship. But, you know, let's talk about his career. He was the first person in NBA history to surpass 15,000 points. Uh, later, Bob Pettit would annihilate that and get 20,000, which later Wilt would annihilate that and get 30,000. Later, Kareem would annihilate that. Later, LeBron would annihilate that. But Dolph Shays was the original scoring leader. Um, as the 50s and to the early 60s, his scoring would go up some as, you know, the game would get faster paced. Um, his career high was 24.9 points per game in the 58th season, but he was never able to recapture a title, you know, and he would, he would actually become a player coach in the early 60s, like Syracuse Nationals in 1963, uh, 60, I want to say 62, he was a player coach, might have been 61, but anyways, uh, anyways, Dolph Shays was kind of breaking down, you know, and a lot of the early stars in the NBA the 1950s, they would break down. Because the game was just more physical, and they didn't have all that advanced medicine and training regiments, you know. This is what surprises me is how long Shays lasted. I mean, the guy played 16 seasons, you know. Um, anyways... <laughs> The Syracuse, as we all know, would become Philadelphia 76ers. Um, they'd move to Philly in the 63-64 season. And I do remember off the top of my head, I apologize, that's the year that he was the player coach. Now, a big reason why he retired is the team was already good. They had Hal Greer. Uh, Chet Walker, you know, this was an up-and-coming team. They didn't really need him as much, you know? So that'd be his last season. But as a coach, you know, I think it's not a secret that he and Wilt didn't get along. Um, they acquired Wilt in the 64-65 season, which we all know that was the year that Havlicek stole the ball. The Philadelphia 76ers lost, but... In 65-66, his last year as coach of the Philadelphia 76ers, Dolph Shades led them to a 55-25 and record. Uh, Wilt and him clashed from what I've, everything I've read, and he was out the door. And they brought back Alex Hainum, who was a coach of the, well, they were Syracuse, when he was 
when they were still in Syracuse, Alex Hayden was their coach. Um, he actually coached the Hawks in the late 50s, too. But he would lead them to a championship in 1967. And I don't think it was a. I don't think Dolce's was a bad coach. I just think the players he was coaching, particularly Wilt, they just couldn't get along. Um, he briefly coached um, the Maccabiah Games, which was a basketball team uh, in the 1977 Maccabiah Games. Which, for anyone who doesn't know what that is, it's kind of like a. Oh. Uh, how do I word it? It's like an Israeli. It's like an Israeli Olympic game. Um, it was the tenth annual Maccabiah Games in Israel, which hosted more than two thousand eight hundred athletes from thirty four countries. Um, anyways, he coached them to, a, and he also played an active role in raising money for the Maccabiah Games because he did have Jewish ancestry. You know, his parents were. Romanian Jews, you know. But anyways, after the after the NBA, after the coaching, he had a pretty successful career in real estate. And not only that, his son went on to become an NBA player. And I'm sure a lot of people remember him. Um, Danny Shays, he wasn't an all-star like his dad. He wasn't a Hall of Famer or anything, but he played quite a while too. Uh, he was a center, six foot eleven. Played from eighty one to ninety nine. He had a pretty long career. He was there, you know. But unfortunately, Dolph Shays is no longer with us. He died of cancer on December tenth, two thousand fifteen, at the age of eighty seven, and he was buried in the Woodlawn Cemetery in Syracuse, New York. And after his NBA career, he spent the rest of his life living in Syracuse. That was his home. And in 1970, Shays was elected to the NBA 25th anniversary team. And at the time, he was named um, one of the greatest players of all time. And in 1972, he was elected to the Naismith Basketball Memorial Hall of Fame. He is also a member of the International Jewish Sports Hall of Fame and the U.S. National Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. And in 1996, he was selected to the 50 greatest players in NBA history. And this one made me really happy. Is In 2021, he was elected to the 75th anniversary team. And the 76ers retired his jersey on March 12, 2016, which they should have done that well, well, well beyond. Way before they did. Just like they retired Mikan's jersey finally, you know? <laughs> Just... Why do they take so long to retire jerseys? Um, I do want to mention, too, a lot of people felt that Dolph Shays didn't deserve to be in the 75 players list. And I get it. If you've never seen the player, you just see black and white pictures of him. But without the first model, you don't have the later models. And Dolph Shays was the prototype power forward. He's what made that position. Yes, a lot of people say it was Bob Pettit, but I think it was Dolph Shays. And he's one of the most important players. Um, he actually increased a lot of popularity in basketball during that time. Um, him and Bob Cousy were the two most popular players in the league after Mike and, you know, after Mike and prior to Russell. That span. They were the two most popular players. They kept asses in the seats, you know. So a lot of these players that you say are firemen, whatever, they didn't make a lot of money. They did it out of the passion for the game. Um, Dolph Shays, to me, no doubt, top 75 player of all time. When you look at the way he innovated the game, no doubt in my mind. And... To give you an example of how impactful Dolph Shays was, when you look at the NBA as it was starting, delete everything you know about the NBA for the past, uh, we'll say 60 years, back to 1963. You go back then, and you look at his resume, 
he'd be in the GOAT conversation in terms of players. And it's amazing. It, I don't mean like he's the GOAT above Mike, and I mean like he's in the conversation as one of the greats. And it's amazing how over time players fall out of that. Because when you read old basketball articles, books from that era, they always list Shays as one of the best players in the league. So that's Dolph Shays' story. Let me know what you guys think down below, and thanks for watching.